What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Absolute Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hunt. We're back with episode 101 with Mike Matthews, fitness entrepreneur, fitness author, the author of Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, creator of muscleforlife.com, Legion Supplements. This dude has uh, his hands pretty much all over the fitness industry. This was a really cool conversation. I've been following Mike for a while. He's one of those guys I've never had the opportunity to sit down with and chat. So this was a, a selfish conversation, but I think you guys are going to get a lot of value out of it. Talked about some business, talked about, of course, some training, nutrition, covered a lot of stuff, covered supplements. Good conversation, good conversation. This week's going to be a busy week on the Absolute Strength Podcast. Lots of episodes, more than than you're used to. Like I said, and I think it was a couple episodes ago, I'm trying out some things. I'm going to try out some things, test it, check the analytics, check the feedback. Make sure you you hit me up at Hunt Fitness on Instagram or Kyle Hunt Fitness at gmail.com <clears throat> or Facebook, whatever, however you want to get hold of me. And let me know what you think about the little bit of higher frequency uploads. I'm excited for it. I just want to keep pumping out quality content. 2018 is going to be a, a, a really, I'm really trying to just focus on what works and what I enjoy. And this podcast is, like I've said before, this, this podcast is my main thing right now. So I'm just going to go all in on it. There's no sense in, in holding back if, if you feel like there's an opportunity to, to do more. And that goes for all areas of life. But I'm going to stop rambling here, get you to the episode, Mike Matthews. But before we do, the Absolute Strength Podcast, as always, is sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps weightlifters and other health-conscious people get lower rates on their life insurance. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash absolute strength, or mention the promo code absolute strength when you talk to a Health IQ agent. I'll put the direct link in the show notes. Enjoy the show. Mike Matthews, what's up, man? That's me. How's it going? <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. What uh, What do you got going on today? Uh, just daily chores, you know. Yeah. Do you train work. yet or do you train later on? Yeah, yeah, no, I go first thing in the morning. So I, I usually I get up around six. Although I think I'm actually changed that to five, but I get up at six and then, you know, whatever, do my morning stuff and then go to the gym. Yeah, I like okay. to get it done first thing. First thing in the morning. You know, that yeah. was it was the weirdest thing. Like when I was in high school, I was that odd kid that I'd wake up at five in the morning, go lift before high school, walk over to school, and then be on with my day. But then in my adulthood, I've just never got that to stick. How come? Well, it's I don't know, probably excuses, but I just haven't. Uh, haven't gotten in a routine to where I feel good in the morning to lift heavy. Um, so it's one that of is, That is a downside. Like, I'm definitely stronger, I would say, by on my big lifts. I would say probably 10 pounds uh, just, just in the afternoon. And you know, there's actually even a little bit of research on it. And it's not just the food in you, but also hormonally. Yep. Like, you know, your testosterone level is usually a little bit higher uh, in the afternoon. And, of course, that's not going to make a difference in terms of muscle gain. But – uh yeah, basically, I wrote about it a while ago, and if I remember correctly, there were a few papers I found, and kind of the the look like the weight of the evidence is most guys are going to be a bit stronger in the afternoon period, um, and then you also have the benefit of like having eaten you know x number of carbs, uh, yep. so just just having more energy. But the for me, I prefer like I mean I'm also at a point where I'm. I've pro- I'm probably at 90% of my natural potential anyway. And so I'm kind of just grinding out like the best I can hope for is grinding out a couple pounds per year, probably at this mm-hmm. point in terms of muscle gain. And so it's slow progression. Uh, so it just is what it is. Um, but then also I like having it out of the way. I think it's also just a great way to start the day. Um, and you know, there's research that shows that your mood, uh, in the beginning, uh, kind of sets the tone for the entire day. And that's one of those things, I guess you don't really need science to like, you can just experience it for yourself, mm-hmm. but th- there is research also that, um, that backs that up. So, you know, I think the benefits of having it out of the way, having that like win for the day or whatever for the first thing, and then also just having the, the elevation and mood, which comes inevitably, regardless of how shitty anything else might be just, you know, the chemical, aspect of, of exercise just makes you feel better. I think, um, for me, yeah, that's why I, you know, have stuck to it. Um, I've, I've tried moving to other times, but 
just always came back to the for, to the early morning. Yeah, I mean the the reason I've kind of thought about it in the past, I'm like, okay, maybe I should go back to the mornings, just like you said, to get it out of the way. Just like mm-hmm. boom, knock it out, and now I don't have to interrupt my day because if I keep working and I'm in a groove, I hate yeah. to be like, oh man, well I scheduled my gym session at like you know one or two, or whatever. Yeah. But I'm really I'm really grinding right now. I don't want to interrupt that. But then on the flip side, like you said, like. You, I mean, I'm just, you just notice that you're stronger in the afternoon. You can look at the yeah. science. You can look at whether it's food, hydration, whatever. Yeah, just, stronger keep, in the just afternoon. keep your logs. Just, yeah. look, just look at your own numbers and you'll uh-huh. see immediately. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can, I can get some upper body workouts in. Like I can do bench relatively similar, but my squats yeah. and deadlifts, if I, if I do that first thing in the morning, it's, it's a noticeable difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it was it was wild because when I was in high school, I trained more for for wrestling or kind of just aesthetics. So I probably never even noticed it. Probably didn't even have enough data to really even compare mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. Which now I have like a nice baseline of okay, these are what these weights should feel like. This is this weight should be about around this RPE. And now if I go in the afternoon, I can hit that in the morning and say, oh, it's not really there. Yeah, but I do like the aspect of being active. So kind of to counteract that, maybe I'll do something like go for a walk or do some mobility, something to get. That, that's what I've done in the past. I've done that, like wake up, go for a walk. Also, well, you can, you can also edit this. I'm going to tell these motherfuckers to turn this music down. Um, hold I on like, one second. I like that part of this. This would be right in the podcast. <laughs> hold on one second. <laughs> hey, I'm recording a podcast. Who's fucking music? All right. That's awesome. What are they um, like people who work for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so, so anyways, yeah, I used to, so I live in Virginia mm-hmm. and it's pretty, right? So right by my house, there's, there's, um, it, it's just a long trail that goes through parks and stuff. So that's also was something nice. It's even, I, that's, that's also good. Wake up first thing, expose yourself to the sun, go walk around in nature. So it's, it's a good option. You know, the exposure to the sun's huge for me because I mean, I work, I'm going to run an online business. So I work in this office at my desk for the majority of the day. So yeah. unless I make an effort to get outside, I just don't. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Same. It's like from my, my yeah, it's like uh, the parking garage. So it's yeah, from my garage to my car to the gym. So I'm walking from the parking garage into like my 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 exposure to the elements is is maybe 10 minutes a day or something at most if I don't go out and, and walk around. Yeah, I mean, especially not in the summertime, like in the summer, because I actually just recently moved down to uh, Myrtle Beach. I live in South Carolina now. Oh, so okay. it's the, the weather's, see, I'm from upstate New York. So it was even worse when I was in New York. Like I just, yeah. I never got the sun. I never saw the sun. It barely came out. But when it did, I was busy. But uh, at least when I'm down here in the summer, you know, I make it a point to go to the beach and stuff. But just trying to yeah. get outside, do a walk, 10 minute walks, a couple times a day can make a big difference there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Wow, wow. So, uh, so how did this all get started? Like, you got the supplements, you got the online business, written, wrote books. What was the what was the starting point here? Uh, so it started with bigger, leaner, stronger. So I, okay. I wrote and published that book, kind of as like a nights and weekends, kind of on a whim type of thing. Back in 2012, it was January of 2012, and I had a, I had a, another business previously. And uh, the reason why I wrote it is because um, I guess the the primary kind of uh, impetus was uh, Amazon's KDP platform, which that's their self-publishing platform, mm-hmm. Kindle Direct Publishing, I think it's I think it's what it's called, um, was getting a lot of press at the time because there was a dude named John Locke who was the first self-published author on KDP to sell a million books. And his story was also kind of interesting. He's a dude, he, um, he built up two insurance. So he built up an insurance business and then sold it and then did it again and sold it again. And the second sale was like, I don't know, 30 or $50 million or something. So he's done with money and he always wanted to write. Mm -hmm. So he he didn't want to retire and just sit around and do nothing because people like that don't, I mean, I've known quite a few people like that. People have made a lot more money that it, you know, they, they thought once, once the, once they're done with money, then they'll just travel the world and do stuff. And I bet people that did that for a little bit. It's just not in their purse. It's just not, yeah, they're just not gonna you know do I mean? that. And then they just get fucking bored. Like, what am I doing? I need to do something. It's yep. it, it, just sitting on a bunch of money. It, I feel wor- useless. You know what I mean? So, so this guy um, decided to just write books and I haven't read any of his stuff, but I think it's the, they're kind of like, I think just fun uh, kind of, uh, off color stories, um, with, you know, some, some sex and violence and swearing yeah. and stuff and whatever. And, and he sold them for 99 cents because he just didn't care about the money. And at the time that was also very unusual because, um, that was also back when publishers were selling 
uh, ebooks for a lot more. So they went through those price wars, right? But like there was a time when publishers would want fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars for an ebook, you know, just as if they're trying to charge the same as as a hardcover. Yeah. And they just didn't they didn't want to accept the fact that the perceived value is lower. Like you're get, with a book, you're getting something with a digital. Yeah. You could say you're, you're getting the experience, but the fact that you're not getting something in your hands, yeah, you're just not getting the physical makes it, copy. Yeah. It makes it intrinsically less valuable, at least in terms of how it's perceived. But anyway, so this guy, he didn't care. He's like, whatever, 99 cents. I don't give a shit. And, um, and it went really well. And so his whole thing took off and he, he became the first person to sell uh, first self-published author to sell a million books on Kindle. So I, at the time, I mean, I've, I've been interested in writing for a long time. And actually, initially, my interest was was fiction, like writing novels. Yeah. But um, but I was like, eh. I mean, I, obviously, I, I know a fair amount about fitness. Um, I know a lot more now than I did then. But I, I knew I knew a fair amount then. Had gotten good results myself, and you know, I'd helped a lot of people I had known just because they had seen my own kind of transformation that I went through and with my with my body, which was pretty simple. I mean, my first seven years, I started weightlifting when I was like eighteen because I grew up playing sports. And then when I wasn't playing sports, I was like, eh, I want to do something with my body. And so I chose weightlifting just because I was like, girls like muscles. I like. Oh, of course, of I'll course, do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll just do that, right? So, but the first seven years, I didn't know shit. I just kind of like followed magazines and just, it was something I just kind of did for fun with my friends. I would say, I, at least I knew that I didn't know though. Um, See, that's a key point. A lot of people, it, it yeah, takes think them, they know. yeah, it takes them going through the learning process and learning a bunch of information to actually realize, oh, wow, I didn't know much. See, that's actually a key point there. Yeah, I mean that's that's like the Dunning Kruger effect, right? Yep, like yep. the 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 dumber people are and the less they know, the smarter they think they are and the more they think they know. <laughs> um, yeah, I deal with people like that all the time. I mean that's yeah. <laughs> unfortunately that that's reality. But uh so so eventually I decided to just educate myself. And say, so, okay, I, let's take this a little bit more seriously because I was stuck in a, uh, in terms of my physique, was just kind of stuck in a rut, not going anywhere. And I figured that, you know, it's just because I've been very uh, random with my training. I've been consistent, but random. Um, trying different things, just kind of having fun, lots of upper body, no lower body standard mm-hmm. shit, right? Yeah. Um, so eventually I decided to educate myself. And on the training side of things, uh, that was more probably started with uh, starting strength and um, and that, that was like my first real introduction to, yeah. to barbell training. And also at the time I had met a, a power lifter slash bodybuilder who turned me on to like, uh, you know, just, just the basics of progressive overload and focusing on, on compound lifting and also focusing on heavier weightlifting as opposed to doing a bunch of lighter, high rep, fancy rep scheme, yeah, you know, drop exactly. sets, super giant stuff, blah, blah, blah. Right. And on the diet side of things, that's obviously a bit easier. That was, I just kind of went to the scientific literature and started actually with just a few good mid analyses and, uh, research reviews, um, which uh, those, especially reviews are generally more, uh, they're easier to read for, for layman, which I I mean, I'd say it's, I'm still a layman. I'm just like a a well-informed layman, I guess at this point, but that was an easy place to start because they're, they are written more conversationally. And, um, and it made sense just in terms of, okay, energy and energy balance made sense to me. Macronutrients balance made sense to me. And that was the beginning where it was like, okay, so I want to get leaner you know, all I need to do is estimate my energy expenditure, eat a bit less than that. Cool. Makes sense. Eat plenty of protein, eating plenty of carbs makes sense. Keep my fat moderate. All right, great. And that was like the first time I got really lean. I was like, Oh, magic. Um, so, so anyways, from there, um, I eventually wrote this book because this was again, after the first time I got really lean and I I looked pretty good, a friend of mine was like, dude, you should just start taking your shirt off, go on YouTube and just sell shit. And, uh, and I was like, that's a, that's a great business model. It works. It's probably not so much now, but back then it was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's actually that great of a business model. <laughs> no, but, I'm uh, joking, but a lot of people I would have say, uh, I would say, built businesses I would businesses say it's, it. a, it's – yeah, but not very good businesses. No. I would say it's 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 a good way to make money if you, have an, if you have a fantastic physique and if you're a narcissist and you're super into constantly showing off your body, yeah. then yes, it's a good way to make money. But I don't think it's a good business model. Like I, there's – there are a lot of things wrong with it from the oh, business yeah. perspective. Um, and especially with the bar being continually raised in terms of what is even a good physique yeah. and the amount of drug use. So like if you're not willing to, to take steroids eh, forget about it, like yeah, you're it's not going to happen for you. Yeah. You're always going to pretty much look like shit compared to the people that, you know, have the genetics and the drugs. Um, and so, so anyways, so I wrote that book. That was my version of, you know, I was like, I don't want to go on YouTube. I don't really care about that, mm-hmm. but I'll write a book because I actually, I actually like writing and I'll just share. It's going to be a, a kind of like a minimum viable product. I'm just going to share here are the, the basics of training, 
the basics of nutrition. Here's how it works. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it. Just do this and you'll see for yourself kind of thing. And, um, that the first edition of that book was maybe 120 pages. Again, I didn't, I didn't try to oversell it. I didn't try to Tim Ferriss it Mm -hmm. and and work in a bunch of marketing bullshit and try to sell it like it's some newfangled, you know, like I made some breakthrough. I was just like, no, this is, here are the time proven principles. And I'm just going to explain them in a way that makes them easy to understand um, and apply. And then you can see for yourself. Uh, And, and it went, you know, well, in the beginning, funny enough. So I published that in 2012, January, and I think I sold like 20 copies that month. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. Somebody yeah. bought my, I, I didn't know if anyone was going to buy it. it, was, yeah, it was zero. Yeah. And I was like, that's cool. And I, and I also put an email address in the book, um, and told people to, Hey, if you have suggestions or questions, just email me. Um, and I think I heard from uh, one or two people or something. I was like, that's neat. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, just kind of let it, I didn't do anything with it in terms of promotion. I just yeah, put it I was, up. I was on curious Amazon. how did you just put it on Amazon? put it on Amazon and just was like, I want to, I I don't know, like, you know, and that's also even from a business perspective, going back to that idea of a minimum viable product, I very much believe in that, in that your, if you're trying out something new, um, your, your number one goal should be producing something quickly that can give you some sort of result, can, can tell you if there's anything here or not. What you don't want to do is spend, you know, hundreds or thousands of hours working on something, um, massive or, or, or even, even if it's not massive in scope, if it's just massive in terms of effort to find out like, Oh, nobody gives a shit. You You just wasted all that time. You see that a lot in uh, the gym business. Oh yeah. Gyms. Like you would just see like people with gyms, like they, they go, I want to start a gym and they just, is that, I've never come in. I get emailed uh, so many people. I've never had anyone say they want to open a gym though. Yeah. Well, it's just like, I see it all the time. Like people who open up gyms and they spend a bunch of money in Uh. buying a bunch of equipment and then, you know, they realize like the, it just doesn't work. Like where the location was bad or the style of yeah. gym was bad. And then they end up also look selling the up equipment against. for uh, pennies on a dollar. Yeah. I mean, look what you're up against in terms of competition. Uh, why should anyone go to your gym over, depending on what your price point is, you're competing against, you know, all the LA fitnesses and 24 hour fitnesses and whatever other, you have that tier. And if you want it to be more expensive, now you're up against Equinox and you know, why, why you? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so anyway, so, so I put that book out and, uh, by the end of 2012, it was selling a few thousand copies a month and I was like, um, okay, so this is a real opportunity. And in that time period, I also had written one or two other short books kind of as trial balloons, just to kind of see what people thought, try different ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and initially though, I actually, I didn't want to get into the fitness industry cause I kind of don't like it. Um, I don't like a lot of the people in it. Now, when I say that, I don't mean the people that are like everyday people in the gym. I don't like a lot of the... Uh, the worthies, the, uh, you know, like the, the, especially the social media space, the influencers and shit. It's just, I'm not into that scene. And, um, a lot of the, the spirit of, um, (laughs) of that element of, of this space just doesn't resonate with me at all. It's just not who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so initially I was like, I don't want to be a fitness expert guru guy. Um, I'd rather take what I've learned about selling books and just start a publishing company. Cause at the time I was like, there's definitely an opportunity and there still is actually, um, to do publishing a bit differently because tradition, I, and I know this very well now traditional publishers, um, like if you're a new author, uh, you're probably not going to get a deal period. But if you do luck out and get a deal, it's going to be shit. You're going to get a shit advance. Um, and they're not going to do anything in some cases. They may not even edit your manuscript. Um, they have distribution. That's what they have. They they can say it's going to go into a bookstore somewhere at some point maybe. And and then if they're going to say it's on you to, to move copies and prove that you're worthy of, of, you know, being published by us, that's kind of the game. Right. And, um, so I was, I was like, I could do this very differently, um, because they don't know what they're doing on Amazon. I mean, I've sold over a million books now and, uh, 80% of those sales are on Amazon. I know how to sell books on Amazon Mm -hmm. and I know things that they just don't know. They just don't do. And so that could be done, um, across many different books. And I know internet marketing, um, very well And my, my partner and CMO, Jeremy knows it very well. And so, uh, anyways, at that time I was like, let's do a publishing company. I recruit Jeremy and, um, we start putting that together. We named the company, start putting the website together. And then, so that was like a two month process. And, uh, so now we're into 2013 and well, this is actually about, end of 2012, actually beginning of 2013. And, um, but in that period we kind of both looked at it. We we're like, 
all right, there's a big opportunity here with, with fitness. And it's something that, I mean, I am into it personally and I'm not willing, while I'm not willing to go about it in the way that many people do, which is what I've seen now is kind of like, instead of, instead of doing the hard work that it takes to get really good at something that's actually commercially valuable, it's all about like networking and just sucking random dicks and shit. And that's, and that's what I'm just not willing to do. I'm not willing to suck up to people who I don't even really like to try to get access to their network and try to get published in X, Y, Z magazine or try to get featured on websites or try to get shout outs on social media. It's like all that, all that shit is, uh, one, it's just not something I'm not interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, and two, ultimately it doesn't have long-term value. It's unless you can produce products and services that people will buy and talk about uh, and like them so much that they will talk about, it's just, it's just not a good business. So, um, for me, I was like, okay, so if we're going to do this, then, um, I just want to do it differently and we're just going to focus on, uh, creating high value content, that's going to be the first thing, right? So then that's how Muscle for Life started. I'm going to write more books, which again, are going to sell me at this point. Um, and what's it called? I think there's a name for it, like the Lindy effect. Uh, and, and it's basically the longer that books are in the marketplace, the, the higher, the likelihood that they will continue to be in the marketplace and continue to sell well. So the longer books sell well, the longer they're likely to continue selling well. And we've seen that with books like starting strength, for example, yep. it just sells every, you know, every day sells X number of copies. It's just locked in. And I've seen that actually more and more with my own, with my own stuff as well. So um, that's how kind of we went about it in the beginning, started muscle for life, bought the domain for like 500 bucks from somebody. And, um, and we launched that website in March of 2013. And that kind of took off very quickly by the end of 2013, it was getting almost a million visits a month. Um, and, and then that's when we started working on Legion because I saw an opportunity kind of like bigger, leaner, stronger, which then I wrote other books, I wrote a book for women. I wrote a cookbook, some other things. Um, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, though, was kind of the book that I wish somebody would have given me back when I was 17, 18 and just yeah. said, here, just just do this. Here's the here's the 20 percent of all the random shit you could learn that's going to give you 80 percent of the results. Exactly. Um, and and so I saw an opportunity to do the same thing with supplements where uh, I was using at the time like ONS Protein, I think ONS Pre-Work, a few different things. And I recommended them on my website and I didn't even oversell them. I was just like, yeah, I'm not, even, I'm not paid by these companies. These are just the products that I use. They're not, honestly not even that great, but I feel like it's better than nothing and that's why I use them and I'm willing to spend the money on them. If you don't, if you're not into supplements or if you don't really want to, you know, spend any money on it, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. Um, so, but I was at that time, I was like, okay, so clearly people are listening to my supplement recommendations. So if I made my own stuff, I know I'm not going to get stuck with inventory and I could make good products. I can make the products that I wish somebody else would be like, if somebody else would have been making the stuff that I have, I may never even start a Legion. I may just like mm-hmm. have bought, just bought their stuff and yeah. made a deal with them. You know what I mean? Um, but you know, that's, uh, that's, that's how that started. And then, um, that was 2014 was when Legion officially launched. So we worked on it throughout 2013 and now, um, uh, you know, it's going to do eight figures in sales this year and we have, um, yeah, big plans over the next three to five years to, to make it, I think, I think in the next three to five years, we could be, well, I don't know. There are a lot of companies whose numbers would, would actually surprise you, but, um, I'd say one of the bigger players, not yeah. probably not, probably not top 10. Um, and then I don't think so because I think top 10 is probably, you're probably looking at a hundred million a year is mm-hmm. probably and up in, in the top 10. But, um, yeah, so, you know, that's kind of the, I don't know. And then a little, a little random things, there's an app and yeah, yeah other books and some muscle for life. Like we're doing a whole revamp now and I'm, I'm putting together digital courses, which I'm excited about because I'm continuing on the book front, but I, what I don't have is anything in terms of multimedia type courses mm-hmm. that are also a bit more in depth. Um, so yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I like how it, it seems like it just kind of fell into place in a way. Like you didn't necessarily start out wanting to get into the fitness industry, but you yeah. saw a need, you saw an opportunity and got into the fitness industry. You didn't necessarily want to get into supplements, but you didn't find anything from the other companies that what you wanted specifically, so you started making them. Like I feel like yeah. that's how a lot of good businesses start. Like you, you just fall into the need, something that you would rather you'd have, but another company is not serving that need. We'll be right back to the show after a word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Absolute Strength is sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps weightlifters and other health-conscious people get lower rates on their life insurance. 
They are the, also the official life insurance partner of USA Weightlifting. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance. Physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive. I like to compare this to saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver. Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. If you think you're too young to worry about life insurance, Life insurance companies calculate your policy rates based on your nearest age, not your actual age. And rates increase as you get older. So lock in the best rate possible by getting a free quote today. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash absolute strength. Or mention the promo code absolute strength when you talk to a health IQ agent. Look, this really hits home for me. I just recently got married. I have a three-year-old daughter. I have a family to support. You hate to think about it, but if something ever happened to me, what happens to my family? I feel it's, it's irresponsible not to have coverage. The truth is, you just never know. I mean, you never know. We live in a crazy world, and it's just better to be insured. So what's unique about Health IQ? When it comes to life insurance, weightlifters usually have issues getting good rates because of BMI. BMI stands for body mass index, and it can't tell the difference between muscle and fat. For example, I'm 5'5 and 165 pounds, and based off of my BMI, I'd actually be considered overweight despite being in good shape and relatively low body fat as well. Health IQ works with carriers to ensure strength trainers, guys who lift weights and have a B- bigger BMI because of that, a buffer to account for the added weight from muscle mass. You owe it to yourself to give this a shot. 56% of Health IQ clients get exclusive special rates. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash absolute strength or mention the promo code absolute strength when you talk to a Health IQ agent. I will put the direct link in the show notes. Yeah, and that's a big thing, scratching your own itch. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you will read about it in their, I think, Lean Startup talked all about it. I mean, there's quite a few business books that make that point that, yeah, there are a lot of great businesses that started with someone just scratching their own itch and basically saying, hey, um, I think this is great. Is there somebody else out there that thinks it's great? And mm-hmm. that's, I think that's honestly actually a much better way to go into business than trying to, I mean, it actually 100% is better. It's much better to do that than to go into something that you don't know much about, you're not that into, and you're trying to just capitalize on an opportunity. And the reason why is it's very hard to understand what uh, those people are going to want if you're not one of them or if you're not, if you don't share enough of uh, their interests and their qualities. It can be done, but you have to be a very good marketer and you have to do a lot of market research. And that's very, very, very few people. I mean, those are the people that you know, work for massive companies and, oh, yeah. and engineer massive product launches and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, even on like a, a small level, like how I started my business was in when I was like 17, so 2009, I saw a lot of bo- online bodybuilding coaches. Like that's what was, it was really popular. But then I was like, man, like I wonder, like I would really like to have an online coach, not necessarily for bodybuilding, but someone that would just like give me a really good workout program, a really good nutrition program. And I can yeah. just do it in the gym. But I didn't really see that. So I started, I kind of was like, well, I was doing personal training in the gym and I kind of saw other people with the same idea. Like, oh man, I don't really need a personal trainer. Don't really want a bodybuilding coach. I just want like an online coach to to tell me what to do. So that's how I kind of fell into it. And then you see now people realize, oh, this is an opportunity to make money. I have a big social media following. Why don't I just try to capitalize off from it? And that doesn't really work because I mean, they don't really know how to coach. They're just trying to to siphon off the followers. There are people. That's what they do, though. They oh just yeah. Chur- they just they just you know churn through them. And again, that's it's a way to make money, but it's not a good business. Yep. And and eventually, when we've seen, um, I mean, I've seen it with with a few people. I guess I won't name names, but who tanked their their coaching businesses through that? Just like yep. taking, you know, they built a following, they established a good reputation for themselves, and then launched a coaching service and did it shittily, lazily, didn't really take care of people, even though they could have, mm-hmm. like one, one person in particular, he could have done it. I mean, he knows what he's doing. It's just, he took on way too many people and was like, eh, whatever, f- fucking YOLO. Yeah. And, uh, and just took people's money and eventually it fell apart, not just from people falling off, but word of mouth got around negative word of mouth that like, yeah, no, nah, his, his program sucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, so if you're going to do it, make sure you do it right. And, you know, I've experienced that, um, fortunately, 
personally in, in a good way because I have a coaching service as well. I don't, I, I'm not coaching people myself, which is another thing. Like some people we've seen that where they pretend like it's them, but mm-hmm. it's just some assistant or oh, something. Yeah. And so, so no, no, I have like a team of people and I, that's very clear in, in the sales copy and it's, there's just no way for me to do it myself. Like, yeah, sure I could, but I have to take my time away from things that are ultimately way more valuable, not just financially, but, um, yeah, things that people would rather like, would you rather have me writing articles, shooting videos, recording podcasts, writing books, or coaching people one-on-one? Yeah. Like if I were to ask my following, what would you rather have me spend, you know, a lot of my time doing? They'd be like, yeah, no, 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 can't, can't, do not coach, keep mm-hmm. doing what you're, you know, but, um, so, so yeah, yeah, I know how much logistical work goes into the back end, um, of a coaching service to make it make it really good, like truly good. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And that's what I always used to tell people like, man, like people don't understand what goes into it. Like to be a good coach, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty much, it's a full-time thing. I mean, so, uh, when you see people who have huge followings and are doing a bunch of other things, that's like a dead giveaway. Let's go. Well, they have like five other things that they're doing. How and, do they run a coaching business? Like yeah. it's, no. And in a lot of cases, it's uh, a lot of nothing is what they're doing. They're posting social media. They're hanging out, you know, uh-huh. fucking sh- show off their cars and shit. <laughs> of course, yeah. What uh, what were you doing before fitness? Like you, you, you mentioned that you had another business. I'm just curious. Yes. So I had, I guess it was kind of a specialty uh, publishing business that I was producing employee training programs for different companies. And we mm-hmm. kind of settled into the niche of healthcare. So dentists, physical therapists, doctors, um, and specifically more on the administrative, like back of office type stuff. Um, so very random, but, um, you know, but it was, it was cool. It was just something I knew that like, yeah, I was good at it. And there's, there's a, there's definitely, I mean, if you, if you moved into the corporate sector, there's a lot of money out there mm-hmm. in terms of training, of course, but I'm, I'm just not a corporate person. I no. just couldn't do that at no. all. So I was, I knew that this wasn't going to be my thing. Like I was going to need to find something else that, uh, it would allow me to, I guess, achieve the level of success that I wanted to achieve. Cause I knew to do it in that space was going to require me to just be someone that I'm not. And it just wasn't going to be fun. So that's why I was like, at the time I was like, uh, I could see if I could, I just was like writing. I could see if I could, if I could get good enough at it. Um, and also marketing as well, just mm-hmm. combine and just have some basic business smarts. Um, yeah, I could do very well in writing. So, so that's why I kind of went in that direction. Yeah. It would seem like, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of get caught up in that. Like they're, they're doing something currently and they want to achieve more and they, they probably know that what they're currently doing is not going to lead to that achieving yep. more, but yep. they're too afraid to jump. Was it, was it like a big deal for you? Like, or was it just like a natural thing? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think I'm, weird and so like i i don't get I and mean, whether it's like from from physical I, I don't i'm just not a worrying i don't i'm not a person that worries much mm-hmm. or is i i mean is afraid of my i don't get anxiety or get anxious about things very easily but to a point where i've even noticed myself I'm like it's kind of weird that i don't feel anything right yeah. now even even with bigger uh I mean, calculated risks that we've taken in business was large amounts of money and things mm-hmm. where it's like, eh, I guess we'll see how this goes. And I'm just like, sure. I, I, it's, it's not that I don't care. It's just, I don't get that. I just, I just don't feel that. So for me, it was just, it was obvious. Like by the time, again, by the end of 2012, I just saw that, yeah, sure. With this one book, I wasn't making enough money to replace, you know, my, the, the other business, but I saw it like, oh, so all I have to do is just do this over and over and that's it. Yeah, that's easy. Um, and that, that was, that was pretty much it. So, um, yeah. And in that, in, in that sense, I was just like, yeah, this is an easy decision. Let's just do it. And I didn't even have to abandon like that other business is still around. It's just, I'm not involved in it at all. Okay. Because again, we established uh, a clientele and there are different like companies that train healthcare professionals that, that started using our stuff and liked our stuff more than anything else. So they just reorder and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I don't even, I actually left it to, uh, just other like people that were working with me. I was like, but I don't care. Yeah. I just get, yeah, whatever you, you take it. I have other things to do now. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, how's your training changed over the years? What are you, uh, what are you currently working towards? What's your training look like? Um, well, I mean, these, I like, actually just put together a new plan just recently. I mean, it's, it's pretty much, uh, what it's always been, which is, um, I like, I like a basic kind of push, pull legs or push legs, pull base 
with accessory work around whatever it is I'm trying to bring up. Mm -hmm. And, um, so right now for me, that's shoulders mainly. So it's a little bit extra volume for shoulders. I feel um, like as a natural, you'll never have uh, that's shoulders what I'm saying. big enough. Never. It's just not possible. Um, and, and then rotating. So one week is a bit more shoulder volume and then another week is a bit more pulling volume just cause I would like, I'd like a little bit more width. My lats have always been super stubborn mm -hmm. and then it's, it's calves three days a week, which is again, a never ending struggle, uh -huh. but getting there slowly. Um, and my compounds are, are mostly heavy. So it's mostly like four to six, you know, 85% rep mm -hmm. range. Um, and I'll probably work in a, a little bit of higher volume, but I like to stick mainly to the heavier on, on my compounds and then do a mixture of heavier and uh, a little bit lighter, but usually not more than 10 or 12. Like if I'm, if I can get 10 or 12, I'm going to move up a little bit yeah. in weight. Um, and, and then it's just, just progressing slowly, I guess is that's, I mean, that's, that's where it's it now. Yeah, that's what it's now, at. now I have probably, I'd say, what are we at? I'm at like five, five and a half years of proper. Cause again, the first seven, I wouldn't say we're a wash, but I, I probably gained about 25 pounds of muscle in seven years. That's pretty shit. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, maybe 30 if we're being generous. Um, and, and also I was, I was pretty weak. So I had to, I mean, when I finally got my act together, I would, I, I was starting, if I remember correctly, I was squatting like maybe 185 max for, for proper, with yeah, proper form. Yeah. Yeah. In, for, for like sets of four. You yeah. Know? So yeah, you had, um, had a way to go there. Yeah, and, and deadlifting, I had never deadlifted once. Oh, wow. um, so, so I deadlifted for the first time like five years ago, and I haven't put up anything super impressive. I made four thirty five, I think, for two mm -hmm. is my best. Um, but I did get to a point in the last year or so, though, where uh, I guess it was about it was about two years ago, where I was happy with my numbers. Like I on bench, I was I had gotten up to two ninety five for two or three sets of two. Um, I had pulled about four thirty five for. I think it was two sets of two and squatted 365 for like three sets of three. So the squat, also my body is just not made. Like I could never be super strong. Yeah. Even, even, even if I drugged myself to the gills, I wouldn't be super strong just simply because of my muscle insertions and also my limbs. I have long legs, long femurs, long, like super monkey arms that yeah. make pressing. My pressing range of motion, really hard. my range of motion on my pressing is twice someone who's because i'm six two ish probably six, twice half. mine i have the short t-rex arms yes and so it's just it's it's tough so those numbers for me i was pretty happy with but uh you know now i'm 33 and i'm also i want to be i want to be i mean i'm in this for the long haul so there i just feel like there is a point in an absolute sense uh, or we could say maybe relative to body weight when you start getting up into certain weight ranges your relative risk for injury just goes up oh yeah even if even if you know what you're doing i mean you know it just oh, doesn't course. It, especially when, you know, it, you have to put in so much more work to make progress as you progress than you do in the beginning. You have to be willing to push yourself. And, uh, you know, that means like, yeah, if you're working in that rep range or, or if you're working in that RP range of, uh, I would say like seven is easy, but you're putting in, a, you're, you're getting to that eight or nine, especially on, on heavier compounds, like, like squat, deadlift, overhead press. And you got to do that if you want to continue getting stronger ultimately. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've also kind of had that in the back of my mind, not as a, it's just, I don't want, I, I didn't really think about it much in the past. And now it is because I've dealt with little things now. I've had some biceps tendonitis that I had to work through. Um, I've had, you know, uh, my SI joint kind of just pissed me, just, just be annoyed and had to ultimately actually what helped it was a chiropractor that adjusted it. Um, cause I guess it was like kind of locked up mm -hmm. and he had to, like, he had to get in there. Really get in there and yeah, but it immediately. Pressure. You know, I felt, I was like, oh, I feel so much better. Right. And, uh, anyways, so, you know, my training now is with that in mind where I want to progress. Um, but I'm a little bit less aggressive in my programming than I was f four years ago or so. Yeah. You definitely see with the longevity aspect in mind, more of like the, the quote unquote, more bodybuilding style training is just more effective. I think just yeah. like you said, when, when you're pushing the weights, like it doesn't matter. You could, your form could be dialed in, but you're just, you're dealing with more intensity. You're dealing with higher loads, you're probably and, and going to get banged fatigue, up. Yeah. When that, I mean, you have that. And then, so like, you, you know, I, you've probably made this mistake. I think we've all made this mistake, not deloading as frequently oh, yeah, as you should. Of course. Cause you're yeah. just like, I feel great. I don't want, I don't get it. If, if, if people don't like, admit to making that mistake, they're full of shit. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so you're like, ah, I feel like I don't have to deload or, uh, you know, and also then there's just the natural as you get more fatigued. I mean, there's research on this, your form just tends to go, uh, your perception of your body and your, where your limbs are positioned, what you're doing tends to go. And, you know, if you're under, if, let's say if you're under a bar of 400 plus pounds, and if that's not lightweight for you, if, if you're struggling, it doesn't take much to no. have, it doesn't have to be a severe injury, but it can be enough of an injury that, you you know, now your squat is like, you're going to be working at almost deload for the next four weeks just to get back to normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And again, too, like when you get the stronger you get, so like, for example, like a RPE seven single for most people, yeah, that's, that's relatively light, but the stronger you get, you're still going to, all right. Like for me, for example, like my bench is my, my best lift. Like I benched over 400 and, uh, I weigh like 160. So yeah, uh, RPE seven for me is easy, but it's still 350 pounds. You know, that's a lot yeah. of weight on there. If I if I don't get a good setup or I get a bad lift off or something, I mean, I've, I actually the last time I tweaked my pec was during a warm up, but it was like like a 340, 345 single, like warming up for something. Yeah, but, you know, didn't didn't get locked in, didn't get a good setup. I'm like, ah, oh, just thinking oh, it's a warm up, you know, whatever. Yeah, but that's I've done that deadlifting. I've done that with yeah. 225. Where, oh, of course. Again, it wasn't, I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't an injury, but I couldn't pull that day just yeah. because of that, where I was just being lazy with him. Like fucking who, who cares? Like exactly. I'm just warming up. Then I was like, uh, that didn't like, it just, my, uh, what? And then that was it. Couldn't pull. I, I, if I'm, it was a couple of years ago, I think even, I think it was like the next week, even I still felt it. And so, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't take that much weight even. And that's, I mean, you're, you're stronger than I am, but I, again, that's when I was pushing it. I was fairly strong. Yeah. Like 225 is not, it felt like nothing. Yeah. Well, that's normally when people get, or even like unracking weights. Like I've seen people literally get hurt from taking a heavy dumbbell from a bottom rack, just from uh. being lazy and reaching over and just being an idiot. And, oh shit, yeah. that didn't feel good. Yeah. The one, I, I, I don't even know ultimately what it, the injury comp- was comprised of, um, because it was, it was what happened was so I was I was deadlifting and um, I was going fairly heavy I was like low fours which is fairly heavy for me mm-hmm. and it was at the end of a set and I and I let out I was I was standing um, and like I was at the top of a rep and um, and I let out my my breath and and the tension in my core yep. mm-hmm. and because I was like done and I, I don't drop the weight from the top I'll get it down to my knees and drop it yeah. not, I don't want to be too annoying about it um, and I felt like my hip my pelvis kind of shift that was that's when i that's when that mm-hmm. si joint issue started and i was like oh fuck. oh man <laughs> yeah because i'd never felt that before yeah and i was waiting for like the shooting pain like that i just hurt did i just like bulge a disc or did i just fuck my shit up and fortunately i was like oh, okay i think i'm fine and it was like kind of hurt a bit it wasn't too bad and i was stubborn so i like dropped some weight and i went to 315 and finished at least my sets yeah and but but i still had like for a few days i had you know some tingling in my feet and and i was like oh did i is that it so uh, in, in the end i guess it wasn't anything too severe because it kind of just went away but that's when that si joint kind of lock up and and that's how um the chiropractor explained it to me um which made sense i mean i'm kind of skeptical about not not chiropractic pure chiropractic. Like mm-hmm. I haven't looked too much into the research on it, but I'm, I have looked a little bit and it seems like there is good evidence that, you know, uh, spinal sublux- subluxations, like correcting those things mm-hmm. can definitely help, especially when you have nerves going through tight little spaces mm-hmm. and, and, uh, it, your body may just correct by itself, but it may not, especially if you lift weights a lot. Cause you have a lot of, our muscles are always tight. Yep. You know, like, I don't know if you, if you get massage at all, but, um, I, yeah, a little I bit. have a, yeah, I, mean, I have a uh, work with someone usually every week, and she I'm the only person that lifts weights that she works on. She's, she At first, she was like, she thought something was wrong. Yeah, yeah. She's like, this is not normal. Every single muscle, like, what is this? And mm-hmm. like, Trust me. It's just, if I if I just, like, took four, a month off lifting, it would feel very different. This is just life. This yeah. is how it works, right? Um, so, so, anyways, but that was an example of, like, that was something was stupid. Like, of course I know better. I mean, you have to maintain your core tension, but... Uh, it was the end of a set and I was fatigued and that was dumb. And, you know, and that, and that was, I would say there was like a good probably three months where I had to dial the weights back and I was started doing mo- more mobility. Uh, I was trying to like figure out what's going on. Uh, started doing even yoga, which I've actually kind of stuck with. I, I think it's great for mobility. I need but to, I need to get back into yoga. Like I've, I've dabbled with it. It'll help your lifting. Yeah. I haven't stuck with it. I haven't got consistent with it. I need to. That's like the one thing that. 
I need to just button down and just, Hey, I'm doing this. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can obviously find all kinds of routines on YouTube or if you just, if that's just not enough, then just, you know, go to a class. Yeah, There's a class, class around. Yeah. yeah. It's just, one of, I actually prefer the class. Like, sure. You can just do it by yourself. Um, and whatever it's boring, you can just kind of work through it. But I found the class is more enjoyable. Yeah. Can, and plus you get like the community aspect of it. Yeah. Like you're seeing around other people and, and other things like just putting it something on the calendar too. It's like, okay, well I have yep. a class at 9am or something. I'm going to go and do it. Yeah, and I think actually it's just, sure. You're more likely to do that than like, oh, I'm supposed to go, you know, into my basement at 9am and do it. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then also you have, if you have a good instructor that has value too, because you know, in the beginning, some of the poses are, are easy and some of the poses are, I guess, at least a little bit technical. It helps Mm -hmm. to have somebody show you like, no, you want, you know, you want your hips in this position or you want whatever. And and you wouldn't necessarily know that just looking at a YouTube video. Yeah, exactly. We talked a little bit about chiropractic. I just want to touch on that for a second because I'm the same way. Like I've looked a little bit into the research and there is some, there is some support there. It just, why does it seem like if there's anybody in the medical field that is susceptible to, bullshit it seems it's chiropractors yeah like, i don't, I don't bullshit you know it always yeah. makes me weary of them i don't i don't know and i think i think again they shoot themselves in the foot collectively by being kind of quackish outside of what is established and legitimate mm-hmm. where it starts getting into um nonsense supplements and nonsense nutritional advice uh and yeah, that's generally what you see the most exactly. of exactly and then and then you it also doesn't help that you have these like fake doctor i won't name any but doctor so and so out there mm-hmm. they're not doctors they're chiropractors right which yeah. is not a knock on chiropractors but it's misleading like they don't there there's a reason why it's doctor name.com they yeah. want people to think they're a medical doctor because people trust doctors that's just an inherent thing and they're in their uh, lab coat on their website Exactly. Yeah, it's that's just, not an accident. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just misleading. Or that it's you have to dig to find out that you know oh they're a doctor of chiropractic. Uh, you know they're not a medical doctor. And then not that again not that it's necessarily bad, but when you combine that with just bad advice or advice that's just wrong, uh, mm-hmm. maybe it's not even bad. Like let's say they're saying they're um, well, I guess in the, I was going to say paleo, but you know the saturated fat orgy I think is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, at least, at least for some people that where it is going to raise the risk of heart disease. But, but yeah, I think again, they kind of shoot themselves in the foot and maybe because it's just on the nature of being kind of alternative medicine. Right. Yeah. Maybe and, that. And being more, I think it's good to be open-minded. Um, and I'll say also, I mean, I, I know, um, a fair number of doctors, just as friends even. And, uh, and some of them, like one, um, is a, is a cancer researcher, very smart dude. And others are just like a general practitioner, a few that they know a lot about certain things, but very little about, you know, like if they were, if they were giving out nutritional exercise advice, you also would be like, you actually know nothing. What the yeah. fuck are you talking about? Yeah. So, you know, so, you know, why exactly chiropractors have kind of copped this, like that everything they say is that the whole thing is just like homeopathy or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. I guess I haven't looked into it all that much, but that is the general perception. Um, I will say, though, I I like to I go to I'll go to a chiropractor for an adjustment probably once every few months Mm -hmm. just because, um, I mean, again, I've had a couple instances like with the SI joint thing where it helped. There's no question like. I had every day kind of just some tightness and she didn't feel right until that was like the turning point after that dude adjusted it. Like not only immediately it felt like it moved back into the place it should be in. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, that's from like, uh, let's say a week later or so, it just didn't bother me ever again. Like yeah. that was the end of, that was the end of the SI joint issue. Um, so I've had a couple experiences like that. And also I would say that, um, yeah, I guess after an adjustment, I'll feel like, again, certain areas, I tend to get tightness in my neck. And so it'll, it'll just feel a little bit better. Now, of course, there's something to be said, though, for like, if you if the muscles are pulling the bones out of place, what's the use of you? Sure. Even if you put things back in place, it's just going to happen again. Yeah. Wake up tomorrow and it's out of place. So, so usually I'll wait for something like that SI joint, something where it's like, all right, this is not just going away on its own. And it feels like something is kind of off you know, I'll go see a chiropractor if it's related to, you know, joints or my spine. Yeah. Well, I've seen too with, um, on the chiropractic thing, like sometimes they'll just say like, oh, well you need to come in every week. And it's kind of like just a indefinite, indefinite, like, 
prescription essentially. Just That's each true. week, every Thursday at four o'clock, we come in yeah, and we do your adjustment. Bucks. Yeah, hundred yeah. bucks. Like I just, yeah. That's what it's never made that that part of it's never made sense. That's true, actually. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that personally again because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I guess you could say you maybe if they they were good, then your spine would spend more time in proper alignment than not, but. Yeah, just not. Yeah, not going to take the time and spend the money. Like <laughs> Every again, week. especially yeah, as a, I would as a rather I would rather put that time and money into massage actually and yoga mm-hmm. actually because yeah. I think that would uh, that's more like what precedes um, you know any sort of skeletal problems would be the the muscle and the fascia and the stuff that is not touched at all in in chiropractic care. So I would rather you know try to keep every, keep the muscles and the fascia in the right places and and try to keep them as, um, unstuck and untight as possible because that'll probably translate to fewer actual needed, uh, like you would need chiropractic less Less. objectively. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. So, uh, what's your, how's your nutrition changed over the years? Not at all. Not much. Yeah. I'd say from the beginning, I mean, growing up, I didn't eat badly. I just didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I, grew, I just played sports. You just eat everything, right? Yep. Um, and and so from the point when I actually, like, got educated, um, it's just, I mean, sometimes I'm following, if I'm cutting, I like to follow a specific meal plan. It just makes it simple. Like, I eat the same foods every day and same amounts. It's just the easiest way to do it. And, of course, you eat what you like. So, you know, and, and I'm not that much of a foodie. Like, I like food, but let's say I've never – and this, this sounds bad and like bullshit, but like, I can't honestly remember ever struggling with cravings. Like I can't remember a time I've ever, I say the same thing and people don't believe me. I say yeah, the same I, thing. I, I always attribute happened. it maybe to like, cause I wrestled through my whole life, but like, I've always just kind of looked at f- food as like fuel type thing. But dude, I, I don't know if I ever had, it. I have more cravings for something like a coffee than I yeah. would ever have for food. Same. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, I'm the same way. So, so in that sense, it's, it's convenient and it makes it easy. Um, uh, but on the whole, uh, you know, I get, I'd say my, my diet actually looks very much like a clean eating type of diet actually. Cause mm-hmm. that, but that's the way that I like to eat. Um, and of course I, you know, know that it doesn't have to be that way, but, um, I've found, so like my, my rationale on it is one, when lo- looking again at long-term longevity, Um, so I want to be when I'm in my fifties and sixties, I want to be in as good as health as possible. Um, and that's physical, mental, emotional. And, um, you know, I I have two kids, like I want to live a long, good life and, um, the nutritional value or quality of your diet matters greatly. And it matters over time though. That's the insidious thing about it is you can eat like shit, especially when you're young, you can eat like absolute shit and feel fine. But then one day you're just kind of broken and you don't really know why, you know what I mean? Like you don't feel the way that you remember, you know, uh, years and years ago feeling, having so much energy and sleeping so well and everything's fine, libido, blah, blah, blah. And now it's just not, and you don't really understand why. And then if you're, you've also at that point, um, spent a lot of time in greening bad habits that depending on your psychological makeup and your, you know, I don't know, your constitution, uh, and, and how mentally tough you are, you might find it very hard to, to, to change. Um, so, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather not have to deal with that stuff. And I know that, I mean, it's like you have the repeated exposure effect, which is not just food, but anything. And I've, I've explained this to many people that like, no matter what, let's say you take someone with the worst diet, all they eat is fast food and fucking crap. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, if that person were to eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains and just like clean foods or whatever, um, every day for probably a month, by the end of that month, they're going to like it. Like regardless of how much in that, that's been proven. And this, that's not just with food. That's with anything. The more you expose yourself to something, uh, no matter what it is, the more you come to like it. So you can just, you can teach yourself to like to eat anyway. So, you know, I, uh, that's why I've just kind of decided a while ago where, yeah, sure. Is there a more immediate hedonistic pleasure in, uh, a Big Mac than a salad? Yeah, there is. Although, I mean, I don't know. Big Macs, I probably haven't eaten one in, I can't remember less. It's probably disgusting. But yeah, I was going to say, I take, don't even know if that sounds good to take, me right now. Yeah, take something. I don't know. I, five Guys. Right? I was going to so say, five, five Guys Burger or something. There we yeah. go. So, five, yeah, there's there's definitely more hedonistic in the moment, instant gratification. Um, but, 
Yeah. How, how much does that really matter though? Again, where if you're at a point where, you know, you don't, you've broken the, the, uh, dependence on food for that pleasure. You just don't care anymore. Yep. It's like my salad. Sure. It's not as if we were to even measure it objectively of like the chemicals in my brain when I eat the salad. No, I'm sure the five guys is, you know, releases more dopamine and, and it, you, you hit that bliss point a lot harder than you do with a salad. But I don't remember. All I know is the salad's good. Yep. Like for me, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. So, yeah. So, um, so there's that. And then also, you know, I, I want to, I, I, let's say that I demand a lot of my body. I guess I put it that way in that, um, all of my sleep's been kind of funky. So I've been like, you know, getting in bed a little bit earlier recently to just cause I've been waking up some nights I'll wake up once or twice. I used to not really wake up at all. Mm-hmm. I would just like go to bed at 1145 and then wake up at 6:30 every day. That was it. Like I would close my eyes, pass out in like five minutes and then I would open my eyes and it's 6 30. Yeah. And that was nice. That's not so much the case anymore. And it might be two kids and whatever. But, um, so now it's like, okay, getting in bed at, at 10 and I've been getting out of bed at six. I think I'll actually, I can go back to five. Um, but regardless, so I'm not like, I don't want to be sleeping a tremendous amount. Um, you know, I'm working out five or six days a week. I, I work a lot and a lot of my work is, it requires mental energy, requires mm-hmm. energy. So, um, and that's in addition to other, even like, I, I just, I don't like, I want, I like to have physical, mental energy all the time. And I'm just not a person to, you know, go, Oh, well, I just want to exert myself for like three or four hours a day. And then I want to fucking Netflix you know, yeah, yeah. turn into a slug. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I'd say given like what I, what I'm asking of my body, uh, it requires, I mean, diet is a big part of that. It requires providing it with sufficient nutrition so it can meet those demands. And I know for a fact that if I were to change that, if I were to just eat, you know, maybe a more standard Western diet, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do, or at least as well as, uh, I'm able to do them right now because I just wouldn't feel as good. Um, so that's the long answer, <laughs> uh, my, my views on diet. No, I like it. I like it. Cause it, it's, it's kind of, it kind of symbolizes how I've changed too. Like in a way, like you, because when, when flexible dieting first got popular in 2011, 2012, like I was kind of on the forefront of that, like writing articles about it and stuff. And I was one of those people that was like, okay, like I've always known like the macro side of it was, was important, but I was always like mind blown by like the, Oh, you, you mean yeah, you, you can't can, you eat chicken nuggets every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, of course, I kind of went down that path for a while. Uh, and then over the years, it just like slowly cleaned up to the, what I'm eating, almost like exactly what I was eating 10 years ago. Just like very, yeah. well, like you say, a very bro-ish diet. I still have the macros in mind, but it's just easier for me from a cons- consistency standpoint. Just eat the, kind of the same foods every day. I know what the macros are. I know how much I'm going to eat. I don't really have to think about it. I don't have decision fatigue. It's just like very simple um, yeah. you know, and then I feel good from it too. Like I've, I've just like really been noticing like when I eat a meal, how do I feel? How do I perform afterwards? And then mm. kind of like paying attention to that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no denying that. Like it's, it's a matter of it's black and white. So it depends. It just, if you want to delude anybody that would say otherwise, sure. You can delude yourself and say that you can have a, a five guys burger and a bag of fries and, and then do anything afterward just as well as uh, you could if you ate, um, we could say whatever, yeah. insert, insert healthy meal uh-huh. right? um, and not, not bullshit, absolute yeah. bullshit. Yeah. And that's kind of actually how I got to that point too. Cause I'm like, okay, well, like I noticed, I'm like, all right, well, man, like I, I can't have this pre-workout because I'm not going to feel good afterwards or I can't have this before bed cause I don't, I don't want it to disrupt my sleep. Then you start thinking, you kind of reverse engineer that. You're like, okay, well, if I'm if I'm already kind of doing this anyway, the then what's the what's the payoff here? What's the benefit? Is it just yeah. 100% because it tastes good? Probably. Yeah. And that that's basically what it comes down to. And you know, I like I don't know what, what's your like little treat? Like I like dark chocolate. That's yeah, I like, my, dark, I, like I, I would say ice cream is my thing. Yeah. So so I, I, that's kind of the flexible side of it. It's like okay, so you eat relatively healthy or quote unquote healthy 95% of the time, yeah, which just means like unprocessed or relatively unprocessed, you know, nutritious foods. Yep. So then that 5% can be your thing, the thing that you yeah. really enjoy and that helps yeah. you on the rest of your diet. 
Yeah, it's just, and it's also just, yeah, it's nice. It's yeah. like a, like you said, like a coffee. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just nice to have. Do you need it? No. Do it's I nice. need the dark chocolate? No, but it's nice. And yeah. there's no, that I'd say there's no ramifications to. I mean, of course you could, I, I would think that if we're really, if, if it really mattered, I do think the general kind of rule of thumb of like, if you're getting 80 ish percent of your calories from unprocessed, which is mainly means plant foods in mm-hmm. the end, right? We're talking about, you know, protein sources are going to be more animal based for most of us weightlifters, but then we're talking about our, most of our carbs and fats just coming from plant foods. Yep. Um, and so if you're getting 80 ish percent of your calories from those types of foods and you really care about it. So let's say, I mean, it, you know, I guess it kind of depends also how many calories you're eating. Cause if you're if you, if you're on a bulk and you're eating upward of four thousand calories a day, if you're going to be you know spending a thousand of those calories on crap, you may not feel too great. But you know if it's a few hundred calories a day on something that um, is is from a nutritional standpoint worthless, uh, mm-hmm. completely nutritionally bankrupt, candy or something, right? Yeah, yeah. You probably I don't think there's any there's going to be any negative side effect physiologically, mm-hmm. uh, mentally. You probably won't notice anything. So it's then it just comes down to how much do you care about eating that stuff? I personally don't really care about it. I could do it or not do it, but I understand that's not everybody. So, um, you know, that's where flexible dieting I think can benefit, you know, people that 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 just care more about that you know, their thing, whether it's, you know, one of the guys that works with me, uh, barbecue chips, he mm-hmm. fucking loves barbecue chips. <laughs> barbecue chips. So, yeah. Random, right? I haven't had those in years. I know, but that's his thing. Right? Yeah. So, uh-huh. so he cares about that, especially when he's cutting. Cause, uh, he also just likes food. He cares more about food, mm-hmm. you know, than, than I do. But when he's cutting, he, he likes to make sure that he can have like a couple hundred calories of barbecue chips a day. All right. Fair enough. Um, if it helps you stick to the diet and, and you enjoy it, it's worth it. It, it fits. Totally. Awesome. Mike, this has been awesome, man. Yeah. Thanks totally. for coming on the show. Absolutely. How can, uh, how can people find out inf- more information about you? Eh, everything's just at muscleforlife.com. Just spelled out muscle F muscle F O R life.com. And then that's where from there, like I have a bunch of articles uh, on the website. It's pretty much a glorified blog. Um, but we're, we're actually currently revamping it cause it still is basically the website it was back when we launched it in 2013. Mm-hmm. Whereas the, the supplement company, if people want to check that out, it's legionathletics.com. If you compare the websites, um, Legion is like a Ferrari and muscle for life is, uh, like uh, a used uh, old fucking Hyundai or something, yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah. So so anyways, we're we're though completely revamping MFL. So you know, if people go there and like, wow, this this website's ugly. I know there's good information though. <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, and then yeah, from there, like I have my books and stuff. Which if again, the books are on Amazon and they're not in bookstores, which is something actually. Me, I'm, I'm gonna. I have my brothers working with me actually helping with a bunch of book stuff, but. Um, yeah, I didn't never got into bookstores because I didn't want to do a deal with traditional publishers. Like, mm-hmm. you know, there was Simon and Schuster was interested in buying bigger, leaner, stronger, and thinner, leaner, stronger. But um, even though the deal was, I would say, generous, uh, especially by publishing terms, in the end, it meant that I would have had to sell double the books, like on a year to year basis. Yeah just by going with them. And I was just to break even on, on current income. Yeah. I was just like, eh, no. So mm. anyways, no, no bookstores, but anywhere online, like Amazon, Google play, iTunes and so forth. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'll put the link to the website in the show notes. What's, uh, what's new with the supplements? You got anything coming up? <laughs> Yeah, so we're working on uh, – well, we just released a nootropic, which I'm excited about, which is something we actually had been wanting to do but just couldn't put together a formulation that I was uh, – and it's not just me. So like I have um, – uh, you're probably familiar with Examine, the yep. website. Yep. Um, so so do you know Curtis? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So Curtis is one of the co-founders of Examine. Basically, mm-hmm. all the technical stuff that you've read on Examine is written by Curtis. Mm-hmm. He is – by far knows the most about supplementation that I've never met somebody as knowledgeable as, as Curtis with this mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, I, I think honestly, he's at the level of like pharma D he's beyond, you know, he, professors in universities. Yeah. He's, he's, he's impressive. So, um, he is, has been working with me on the formulations since the beginning. It's just, uh, and now he actually just works with me. It's like he, he heads up my scientific advisory board, which includes people like Eric Helms, James Krieger, Spencer Nergalski, Menno Henselmans and so forth. So I have a, I have basically a bunch of people that are much smarter than I am that know a lot more about supplementation. And, and I would say just pretty much everything. Yeah. Uh, and so it's nice that, uh, you know, basically I, I, sometimes I have some input that's worth something sometimes not, but, uh, so Curtis in particular, 
particular, you know, from a marketing perspective, yes, I wanted a nootropic um, because they're super hot. And I think that's going to continue to, to, to that trend is going to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we just couldn't come up with something that we felt strongly about basically and, and felt that we could really market, uh, really promote honestly in a way that also makes you want to buy it. Yeah. Um, because you know, I, I don't want to create a product that if, if I'm being honest, it's just like, eh, it's not very good, but <laughs> yeah, you don't want to say it'd be like, it'd be like, BCAs. like uh, I, we had asked every day, why don't you sell BCAs? We have the same, like, cause they don't do shit. Yep. They're worth cause they're mm -hmm. worthless. I, and sometimes people will say, I know, but I just like them. Can you sell them? <laughs> so, so, just so get, like, uh, tell them to get like a crystal light and put in their water. That's, that's not, yeah. Or, or, or yeah. Or, or put some fruit in water. I don't yeah. know. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I know it. But so like that would be, I don't want to sell a product like BCAs where basically the pitch is like, yeah, this product's pretty much not, there's pretty much no reason to, to have this ever, but if you want to buy it, you can buy it. Yeah. Um, so, so, but we finally came up with, uh, a, a formula for the, for the entropic that we really like. So that, so that's cool. And that one was received really well. Um, we weren't sure, but it, it sold out in like three weeks. So we were like, Oh, well yeah. now we're out of stock for two months. That's yeah. cool. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so that we're working on protein bars, which, um, has been a pain in the fucking ass. We've been working on protein bars for like seven months, probably. Yeah, I've heard that it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, it's also it's also again because we want to make a high quality bar. Like we're using high quality. We went into it wanting to go um, just way isolate and micellar casein, but mm -hmm. we found out casein is a no go. Like casein, it'll it'll just be a goopy pile of shit. Yeah. So, um, so now it needs to be a blend of ways. So we have isolate and concentrate. They want to use milk protein and milk protein isolate can be okay, but it just has a stigma, which I understand because you just. You know, the further you get away from whey isolate, the less you really know what you're getting basically yep. in terms of protein by weight. So I was like, no, on the milk problem, I'm okay with concentrate as long as it's a high quality. Like I want like an 80% yeah, protein. Like 80, by yeah. I want a good concentrate and an isolate of course is fine. And then we also included some pea protein for texture, which I'm fine with as well. Um, and then some high quality carbs, uh, which un unfortunately, um, one is like it looks like we're not gonna be able to use because the own oh, the single manufacturer of it uh is not manufacturing anymore so because we got to the finally got to the finish line we're like we're done uh we have everything that we want in this bar um and it's also naturally sweetened naturally flavored that's one of our things we don't use any artificial food dyes or flavorings mm -hmm. or chemicals at all um and and that was a big that was like probably I'd say three months going back and forth with samples, just getting, if the taste wasn't, if the taste was good, the texture was bad. It was too chewy. If the texture was good, the taste was bad. So we finally get there and then find out that one of the ingredients now is not available. So we have to find another one, but we're close. I don't think that's going to like derail it too much. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited for the bars. Cause again, there, it's going to be, um, I want to say, uh, I'm trying to remember the macros. It's, uh, it's, it's about, I want to say 25 grams of protein per bar and high quality protein and not amino spiked bullshit protein mm -hmm. um which is worth saying especially with protein oh bars. yeah for sure and, and about 40 grams of carbs and about like seven grams of fat if i remember correctly um and so it's kind of like a mini meal replacement yeah, meal replacement bar cool cool yeah yeah and so so we have that and we're working on a stim free pre-workout which a lot of people have been asking for um and an energy drink as well oh, which cool. like uh ready to drink yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so RTD, we're actually, we're going to do RTDs for our pre-workout pulse, mm -hmm. but we want to do a, a straight energy drink, which is going to be a bit different of a formulation. Um, just cause I mean, obviously like the energy drink's not going to have citrulline. It's not gonna have beta yeah. alanine. Beta it's going to yeah, have other yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So we have a number of products. I mean, it's, it's just an ongoing process of new products and new flavors. And it's, it's, again, it's just like the type of work that's a pain in the ass and you grind on it for months and months and months until mm -hmm. it's finally done. And then, you know, you get, you get the reward. So <laughs> awesome. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the absolute strength podcast. I know I had a ton of fun producing it for you. And before you go, if you could just drop me some feedback, I'd love it. I love reading your feedback. So you can go over to iTunes, leave a five-star rating, write a little review of what you think of the podcast. I absolutely love it. I read every single one, but it's cool if you don't want to do that. I get it. I get it. No one wants to really go out of their way to, to do anything, let alone write a review, but I want to get your feedback. So send me, drop me a line on Instagram at Hunt Fitness or on Facebook, Kyle Hunt, or on Twitter or send a, a pigeon or something. I don't, I don't know. I just want to hear your feedback. So if you want to give me some feedback, let me know what you think. Hit me up on Instagram at Hunt Fitness. And before you go, I have one last thing. One last thing I want to say. 
I have a program I want you to check out. It's actually called the Absolute Strength Program, and the link is in the show notes. It's a program I designed to help increase my own squat bench and deadlift. And I got pretty strong off of it, and I think you're going to like it. It's a, it's a great book. Thousands of people have got amazing results from it. It's in the show notes. All right, guys. Until next time. Until next episode. Peace.